Welcome to View from the Grandstand. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Justin Pora. For the first time in the short history of this podcast, I have a longer episode for you guys rather than the usual four-minute chat. The reason for that is because I'm joined by my first guest right now in Corey Petrucelli of New York Interconnect. Corey is closing in on year three as the Senior Director of National Sales at NYI. He's a graduate with an MBA out of the College of Mount St. Vincent, and he's with me right now. So, Corey, thank you for joining me. Awesome. Glad to be here. Thank you so much. All right. So over the past year now, we've seen a world without live sports and have transitioned into live sports without fans. And now we're getting limited fans into some arenas. And in large part, how do you feel sports leagues have handled the COVID situation in terms of the product that has been put on television with a huge element of the game's excitement being absent? It's a it's a tough question. I, I, I would tell you as a fanatic and someone who is a, a, a huge emotional fan of sports that has definitely been different, but I, I, I really have to say each league was presented with its own challenges. And I think that they, although they all handled it differently, right? The, the dynamics that go into every league. So the NBA created a bubble. Hockey attempted to create a bubble, not as much. Baseball did a condensed season. And what did they do? They created many regional bubbles against teams within certain divisions, realign the divisions. But I, I think the biggest undertaking we could say is the NFL season because of the size of the rosters, the fact that the games were still played at a rather normal schedule, meaning the travel across east to west. But I think all of the leagues have figured out a way to do the best they can. Look, we're, we're in unprecedented times. And in March of last year, situation where one night the Big East tournament's going on they get halfway through the first game at Madison Square Garden and they call it it was either that same night or the next night the Jazz are on ESPN and Rudy Gobert tests positive pre-game and they call they call the game and at that point you you had the infancy stages of COVID as it was relating to the to the world and what the pandemic meant and you had so much information flying out there. And all of a sudden, sports took this hiatus. And you're like, this is what prompted me to start writing what I did with Media Village a couple months ago is that, wow, like you're in a, situ- you're in a situation where I would argue the most powerful, visible platforms that we have in our country just stopped. And that's kind of, it's kind of alarming. So I, I would say that given the situation and the fact that we are all in unprecedented waters, I, I would just circle back and say, I think they all did a really good job. Everything had challenges. There was bumps in the road. I'm not saying everything was perfect, but at least they had plans. There was concise plans. And I think Adam Silver in the NBA has done a really, really good job in putting protocols in place and figuring out how to do it in the safest way possible may not be the safest for all the athletes in terms of the amount of games they were playing in a condensed period of time, but from a safe, safe, you know, medically medical standpoint, I think that they did a really good job. And uh, just going back to something you said, I will never forget that day. I believe it was March 12th was the day now. I mean, (laughs) almost a year ago, kind of crazy to think about. I was still a senior at Syracuse university I was doing the post-game show at WAR's student station for the Syracuse-North Carolina game. It was the ACC tournament, Mm -hmm. and Syracuse was trying to make a case to get into the tournament. And I'm sitting there with my friend, and it was the day the Jazz game got canceled right before the tip. And we're looking at each other, and we're like, I guess these professional sports leagues are getting affected by it too. And then we're getting more and more information that the entire league stopped. And we're sitting there like, this is the last college basketball game that's going to be played this year. Like there's not going to be a tournament. And it all kind of came at such a abrupt stop that I don't know if anyone really knew what was happening in real time. So to your point, to see that these leagues, especially the NBA that were able to kind of take a moment, they took some time, said, this is what we're going to do. And they were able to put on a product like we saw in the playoffs in 2020. It was just yeah. Absolutely incredible. I, I mean, there were a few weeks ago, we had football, basketball, and hop, hockey on at the same time. 
that's unprecedented. The U.S. Open, you had so much going on. But I think, I think one of the biggest challenges that came of this is what do the networks do? You have regional sports networks who have licensing rights to the local teams. So that in New York, it's, you know, the Knicks and the Nets. And if you're using NBA, but you have the networks like Fox Sports, ESPN, what are they doing? I, I think one of the things that we found, especially with ESPN and, and, and to their credit, they have an arsenal of, of, of creative and an arsenal uh, with di- being owned by Disney. They can present things a little bit easier than some of the other networks, but the fact that they pivoted so quickly and pushed up the start date for the 30 for 30 or the Michael Jordan, the last dance documentary series where they did that six part docu-series. I mean, they, they really moved that up and they made it a appointment TV six weeks in a row. And essentially what we've learned is that, you know, the, there's an, there's an appetite for all things sports, right? And, and, and if done the right way, whether it's live sports with fans, live sports without fans, or quality docu-series that are created about players for fans, there's an audience. I think that's one of the other things that you got to give a lot of credit to. You know, you, you have networks that are reliant on live sports as one of their major revenue drivers. And, and they were forced to pivot as well and pivot, pivot into the unknown. You know, so you don't really know what to expect, but the audience was there. Ratings held strong in, in a lot of, you know, our, our key male networks. And I think overall, both the leagues and the networks did a fantastic job pivoting. And like you said, regrouping and making a decision that made the most sense in a, in a safe way. And you mentioned how, you know, credit deserves to be given to these networks for putting on the live broadcast with all the challenges presented to them. They had to do a lot of different practices that, you know, we've never seen in games before. We've seen virtual fans. We've seen play-by-play guys unable to actually be at games. Do you think that this is in a way kind of been a learning experience to see what these networks are going to be able to play with in the future, even as we return to normalcy? Do you think any of these practices that they were forced to implement are going to start becoming every day in these live broadcasts? Well, I'll tell you this. I don't want to make this (laughs) a deeper conversation than it is, right? We're keeping it light. We're talking about sports, but I think our world has realized that there are th- ways we can do things differently across all facets, right? So whether that's at home, at work, in the sports world, in the television world. So yes, to answer your question, I think there, I mean, the fact that when the NBA was in the bubble, you're seeing virtual screens in the background powered by Microsoft Teams. And now you're seeing these, now, now in all the leagues, now they're no longer in the bubble using the NBA as an example, you're seeing the backdrop of, of the team logos in the stands. The fact that last night you were saying you were watching the, you were watching the Lakers get blown up. LeBron's complaining about a call. You can hear him. You can hear him complaining. You could hear, you could hear them tuning down the volume as his, as his frustration gets, gets more ramped up. You know, I was, I was telling a colleague of mine, I think one of the things that I enjoy most, now, I, again, I'm, I'm, I'm a sports enthusiast, right? I enjoy it. When you're watching a basketball game, you know, and you're, you're a kid and you're in high school and you're sitting right on the court or you're playing in AAU, all you hear is the sneakers, right? The squeaking of the sneakers on the floor, the rubber, the rubber hitting the polished hardwood floor. And then you hear the whistle of the ref. I mean, and that's, that's what it's like watching a game on TV right now. You have announcers that have really no background, you know, no, no background noise, nothing. And, and they're, they're constantly pivoting. So I think that's pretty remarkable. I also think the fact that You know, you have Mike Breen who's sitting in New York doing a game that's happening in LA. And the fact that it just goes to their level of expertise and how polished some of these guys are, because that is not easy, you know, doing a a remote broadcast of a live sport with no delay. You're essentially calling it as it happens. What does that mean? Justin, honestly, we could see it be done differently. Like it, it proves to you, you don't need to be there. And it and it proves in a lot of industries that you don't need to be there to be effective. I do believe the camaraderie that is developed at the at the desk, you know, like using Mike Breen and, and Jeff Van Gundy and that whole group, you know, I think there's camaraderie when you're sitting next to each other. But I think, again, I think all of the networks have handled it really, really well. And it, and it shows you to the, the level of expertise and how much they value the product, right? Because it's when you're on TV and there's no crowd, and when LJ goes up for that for that four point play in, in, in the garden and, and 
makes his famous LJ with his arms, you know, you're not going to have an erupting crowd, right? You don't pumping in crowd music, but um, you know, I think they've all done a really good job. And I think that what we found or we've learned on the media side is that, look, there is an appetite for sports. I know I said it a few minutes ago, but you know, there is an emotion and Justin, you were saying, you know, you and your dad could be a fan of a team. And if your dad's dad was a fan of the same team, I mean, that those are things that are passed down from just from uh, generation to generation. And, and, I, and I just think, I think sports create an environment where people can, you know, have emotion, be free, enjoy something, kind of relax. It's a, it's a way to, you know, to conversate with your, with your friends. It's, it's water cooler conversation. There's just so much value that sports brings to the, to the landscape. Corey Petroselli of New York Interconnect joining me on View from the Grandstand. You referenced earlier the article that you wrote in conjunction with Media Village. And one of the main components of that article was that this idea of cutting the cord that we keep hearing about, that streaming is taking over, that idea isn't necessarily true because of live sports. Everyone wants to be as updated as possible in real time. Now we're a year into this pandemic. We've seen live sports on television change in a completely different way. It just doesn't look the same as it used to. And we know that we're probably going to get to a point soon where it looks what it looked like before. But do you think because of everything that has happened and the changes that have been made, that this idea of cutting the cord is still something that we're going to have to push off for a while? Or is it something that you think is coming quicker than we think? Great question, Justin. As I said back in August, you know, I, I believe that live sports and live local sports specifically, because each market, sports are germane and, and unique to every market. And for the most part, you live somewhere, that's the team you want to represent. You know, unless you're a transplant, that's a different story. But for the most part, the lion's share of the people that live in that region, you know, they're a fan of the Knicks or the Nets or the Yankees or the Mets. And so I would say this, and, and look, I've, in my business, you know, I've had the opportunity to be connected through cable, right? Through the set-top box and watch sports. I've also had the chance to use some of the streaming platforms through my cable subscription. So I can watch the NFL on NFL Network using my cable credentials. But I don't know, I mean, I'll ask you the question. Have you ever had a chance to watch the NFL on Twitter through an IP versus your set-top box? Not on Twitter. I think the NFL is different, right? Because the NFL with the way every game is broadcasted is on a national network, right? So you have the opportunity, like it's CBS Fox one through four, right? Every game during the day on Sunday is on one of those two major networks. And, you know, I'm lucky enough that I have NFL red zone and that is the ultimate way to watch football on a Sunday. It bounces from game to game. But, you know, when it comes to something like basketball, I'm a huge NBA junkie. And I'm a Miami Heat fan. I live on Long Island. I can't get Miami Heat games every single day. You know, there's less wiggle room for that. You have to find other means to be able to watch these games that, you know, regular cable television doesn't provide. Yeah, so that that's a situation where there needs to be some form of, rather than cutting the cord, you're potentially in that case, you know, stacking, right? So you're going to go get the NBA League Pass so that you can watch out-of-market games, whether you do that through your set-top box and your cable provider, or whether you do that um, directly with the NBA, those are your options. But to your original question, this year, this past year, changed the circumstances for a lot of people. So being sympathetic, there are certain things that are necessities and there are certain things that are want. So I'm, I'm, I'm very sympathetic to the fact that everyone has to do what's right for them. And I've always said, I told you, I'm, I'm a sports enthusiast, right? You just said you were an NBA junkie. There's an emotion to sports. And for me, my kids go to bed. My kids are four and three years old. I put them to bed at night. My wife and I, you know, share, you know, can reconnect after a long day of work. And I turn on sports because it's, it's like a release. I enjoy, although Anthony Davis didn't play last night, I enjoy watching Harden and, and Irving against basically LeBron. Cause it just was whatever. It was a bad game. Let's just put that one to the side, but, but still, hey, finals preview. That's on national. That's, TV. It. that's it. That's it. That's it. And TNT, you know, had the game. And, and at the end of the day, to me, it's a release. So what I believe is that you are going to have people who ultimately say, I only watch a group of channels. So I'm going to go out and figure out another way. And so what has happened in the landscape, right? So yes, you have the AVOD competitors. 
that have come into the space. And then you have the cable companies who have really, because that cable company owns the pipeline to the house. So even if you're not subscribing to their cable service, you still need their pipeline to get your internet provider, right? What a lot of the cable companies have done is said, okay, I, I'm sympathetic to that. I understand that. Let's do a skinny bundle where you're, instead of getting a set-top box in your house, you're going to our MVBD. So let's use Comcast or Spectrum, for example. You're going to our Spectrum app on a various of platforms, whether that's on the Fire Stick, Apple TV, preloaded on the Samsung TV or the Vizio. You're authenticating with your credentials that you're purchasing, and now you're able to watch TV basically over, over, over IP, right, over the internet. So there is a, the, the maturation of how content's being consumed is, is changing dramatically, whether that's on a device, whether that's through a subscription. Um, but I'll tell you this, again, I'm a fan. I've never watched, um, I, have, I have some friends who are, are in that category, and I've never watched a, a live event over the internet that I'm happy with. And that's just me. Again, nothing against it. It's just that I feel like there's a lag. I always feel like, like I was using the example to a friend the other day. You know, I, I, get the, I get the touchdown on my phone before I watch it on TV and I'm watching the game in real time. And I think that's the number one thing. Yeah, and that's something that a lot of people don't like. And again, things get drastically more expensive, right? Because where are the majority of dollars? When you're going and you're doing an a la carte model, you're, you, know, you just graduated college, Justin. So you're going, okay, I need internet. So I'm, I'm going, I'm going to, I'm going, you live in Long Island. So I'm going to Optimum for my internet. I'm going all T's for my internet. Great. I need these channels. Boom, 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 boom. But I don't need them all. So I'm going to start piecing all this together. And then you very quickly realize that when you want layers of sports, it gets expensive when you're going all different vehicles. So again, there is certain situations for everyone. And, and I would, I would say that we're in a time where people are defining what makes the most sense for them. I still believe cable is the, is the strongest and I believe it will continue to evolve because technology is evolving and the cable companies are working on platforms that allow all of everything to be IP based, which is gonna happen eventually. And I'm, you know, I'm, I'm looking forward to the fact that the one thing I can tell you is no matter how they consume it, people need to consume it. If there's anything that is, is appointment TV still in this, in, 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 in America, it's the ability to watch sports. And I think especially now, there's a lot going on. I think sports, the fact that it's back and it's, although not everyone's in, in, in the stadium or the stands, there's a need for it. So people are going to figure out how to get it one way or the other. Corey Patricelli, New York Interconnect, joining me. And let's go back to the product that they're putting on TV in this day and age. And I think the one sport that, to me, as an enthusiast, as a consumer, that has suffered the most with no fans has been college basketball. And I went to Syracuse University. It's just not the same, you know? The Dome with 35,000 people in it, there's nothing like it in any sports venue. I will take that to the grave with me, outside of maybe, you know, the big house in Michigan for Ohio State. That, that's really the only thing I could compare it to. And last year, we were all deprived of the March Madness NCAA basketball tournament. It's coming back this year. They're playing it at one location and it's going to be, I think when you talk about cable television and what is accessible to everybody, there's nothing like the tournament because every single game is broadcasted on a channel that's given to you by your regular cable provider in that generic package. I still know what true TV is only because of the NCAA tournament. So how do you expect this March Madness experience in 2021 to look compared to 2019 every year before that, after having a year hiatus that I don't think anyone saw coming in the moment. Well, I would tell you this, Impractical Jokers on True TV is very happy that term. You're right. You're right about that. Very happy they negotiated the March Madness package to shed some light on that network. No, look, I'll start by saying, before we talk about what I think the March Madness means to 2021, it just goes to show you again, it's proof that the power of sports is, is gigantic. It has been or had been for many years a CBS only broadcast, right? So there was, you know, the, the brackets would come out, there'd be a select number of games in each round that were at, that were on air, and, and that was it. And then there's this mega deal put in place, which allows, to your point, every single game, including the now first four play-in games, includes every single game to be broadcasted on four major networks. 
and then they and then and then certain rounds flip flop every year between CBS and Turner, right? So it's it's an agreement, but it it shows you it shows you that the magnitude of that event, in my way, it would be I would explain it as cable cables kind of Super Bowl, right? It's a except being one day, it is multiple weeks of wall to wall basketball, and whether you're a casual fan or you're a diehard Syracuse fan. You know, in New York, it's a little bit unique because St. John's hasn't really been that good. I'm, I'm taking Syracuse out of it. I grew up in Connecticut. I'm a diehard UConn fan, so I get it. We have some battles offline. We could talk about UConn, Syracuse, <laughs> and some of those some of those matchups. But um, to your point, it's must-watch TV. Now, how is it different this year? Well, not as many people are working in the office. So that boss button they have up on the on the on the online screen when you're watching on your computer at work when you should be watching should be working. You don't have to click that boss button since you're going to be sitting at home. No, I'm, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> look again, March madness was in that you, you referenced March 12th as the day where kind of the light came out from the professional sports world. And then there was like a, a, a week period there where the NCAA commissioner and the teams or in the leagues were trying to decide how are they going to move forward? And they said in the best interest of the students, which is the ultimate goal because they're not paid to play they were going to cancel it. And again, that was another notch that the pandemic had become this, it, you know, there was so much, the pandemic is, it still is and will for a very long time affect our, our world. But the fact that it came ripping through the sports world was, was in a way gut-wrenching, right? Because a lot of people, I remember watching, I, I go back to that, that, that night, watching that NBA game thinking, all right, I still got this. And then when, when you realize that th this, this situation was bigger than sports, you kind of go, okay, let's regroup. So I think this year from a advertising perspective, okay, let's start from a country perspective, the fact that they've decided to do it in a bubble, essentially in six venues in one location is their commitment to making sure the event is as good as it can be, right? And as normal as it can be in 2019 and before. And like I was saying, whether you are an avid fan, casual fan, or just turn it on because it's March Madness, it is powerful. Those kids watching those those kids play basketball and watching some of those lower seed upset, you know, I feel like Duke gets upset every year now. I don't really care about Duke, so that's fine. But you know we agree on something. Yeah, we're we're in agreement there. But I think you know, there is a there is a passion, a power, you know, something that's unique there in that college atmosphere that you're not going to get in professional sports, which I think is really powerful. So that's that. From the advertiser stance, there's a unique opportunity to align with something that hasn't been here in two years, essentially, right? Since March of 2019. And it's a brand safe environment. And it's well, it's well done by Turner and CBS. You know, they're Chuck and, and that whole group that that commentate. I mean. It is amazing, and I'm interested to see how they do it. Do, are they bringing the announcers to the bubble? How's it working? So there's a lot of schematics that are going to be interesting. But from the advertising perspective, I truly believe ratings are going to be higher this year than they've, than they've ever been because you're going to have, again, you have people that aren't congregating at bars and restaurants to watch. They're not having viewing parties. They're going to be at their homes. So, so the ratings should take a, you know, an increase because of that. But there's also been this void. Like, like I said, there's something about March Madness that no other sport – creates it's I was talking to someone earlier and I mentioned World Cup and I know that's on a much bigger scale but that's similar where it's wall to wall to wall to wall through the rounds that's this this look and feel of what March Madness presents is is awesome and from an advertising perspective you know you have the chance to gain amazing eyeballs in a brand safe environment utilizing sports there's really no better no better way and then look the networks need it right turn they, they need it you know, at the end of the day, it's 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 important to the media ecosystem that events like this happen because there's a long tail. There's a and and I'll just say this because it's important. You know, there's a long tail to sports. The reason having fans in the stadiums and in this and in in the arenas is so valuable is because it employs such a drastic number of people, not just people going there, but think of all the people who who work for these these food service companies and the deliveries. You know, and, and there's some, you know, that's important. That's very, very, that's more important than sports itself, but that's the catalyst that sports is. And then from a, from a, a revenue standpoint for the networks and the ability to 
you know, continue to put a great product in front of the television audience. It's, it's all really, really important. So I'm, I'm yeah. for March Madness. I'll, you know, I'll let you into our bracket. We'll do a bracket together. See who wins. Let me know. I'm all in. I, I, uh, <laughs> man, I forgot that I got to do that. It's yeah. been so long. I'm I know. I know. All last year, two years ago, I had Virginia. I knew they were going to. You can do, Virginia. you can do with that, with um, someone's daughter a couple years ago, just picked every player based on the name of the mascot and he won the ESPN shootout. So that, that's how go. it works, right? Yeah. <laughs> all right. So we, we bring up this date, March 12th, a couple of times now. And I can only really give my perspective in full fairness because I was a college senior and I went home for what I thought was spring break. Everyone kind of knew we weren't coming back, but you know, we just never did. And for that week where we didn't really know what was going on to me, it felt like the world completely stopped, but especially in the world of television, nothing really stops. You can't have dead air. There's always going to be a product that's on TV. So being in the industry, as this was all going down, where did audiences and advertisers really go in this period where there were no sports and how did they kind of come back from it once everything started getting back to a place where there is stuff on TV that we will watch? I think, great question. I mean, the, the simple answer is with what was going on in our country, the, the news networks, whether that's regional news or national news, got a huge lift in, in ratings and in eyeballs because there was a conscious effort of, I need to know what's going on at all times. And it, when you look at your local news and New York is such a strong media market that you know, the governor was speaking daily in the beginning and the governor of Connecticut, New Jersey was doing the same. So there was, there was a lot, a lot to be consumed. And I think that from, from an eyeball perspective, initially, you know, things, the pendulum swung all to news as people were trying to ingest as much of what's going on. And, and then I think people started to find, okay, I need my release again. And to the point that we brought up earlier, you know, the, the, the Disney holding companies, the ESPNs of the world, they have a plethora of content, which they can release to, you know, Michael, Jans Michael Jordan's Last Dance, things like that, the 30 for 30s, different types of docuseries. And then you have the other, like the Turner family of networks. What do they do, you know, when they're not carrying NBA games? Well, they can release their movie library, right? Or they can bring, a what a lot of network did was push up things that were already produced, new programs that were gonna launch later in the year. They, they brought them ahead and, and, and made new episodes readily available during a time when people were had a chance to watch something but i would say the daytime became almost as valuable as the prime time the traditional prime time viewing because people were consuming differently because again the world in the beginning shut down and most people were sitting in front of you know working long days in front of their computers in front of their tvs so and there was this need um so that's where they went um and I don't, look, no one knew what was going to happen, right? I mean, we were, <laughs> to your point, March 12th was kind of like the rug got pulled on. And then, and then it became really serious, at least for me, speaking from experience, like it was serious. But then when I saw that all the major sports leagues were being canceled, it puts it in another perspective because then it shifted to, this is what coronavirus is causing our country to go through. And then you start to really, you know, that first 10 days where you're kind of in a fog and then all of a sudden, it really became apparent what was going on. And, and, and again, you know, I'm happy we're on the, the other side of this and I'm happy that we've made strides as a nation and as a world to hopefully overcome this and learn from it and move forward. Corey Petroselli, New York Interconnect, have a couple more questions for you, but I need to tell a story and I'm going to drop a couple of my friends' names because they deserve some credit for this. So two seniors at Syracuse right now, Will Scott, Gil Gross. Syracuse supposed to play at Louisville on Wednesday and our student radio station does a really good job. They send kids to all the games. They were on their way to Louisville to cover the game. Their flight gets canceled. They drive 10 hours to Louisville, Kentucky from Syracuse, New York, and they get there. The game gets canceled and they have to drive all the way back because of health and safety concerns. This has been happening over the past year. Not every game has gone as planned, as scheduled, there's been postponements. So in a person of your position, how do you educate when you're not tapping your, we couldn't predict any of this that was going on, but 
you know, you have to adapt on the fly. And as someone in your position, you have clients that you kind of have to talk through this and, and keep them hanging around, even when, you know, quite frankly, we don't know what's going on. Well, I'm sorry that your friends had to make that trip, but I will tell you this. They will never forget that and the bond that they got to share and that 20 hours of driving between the between there and back is something they're never going to forget, you know, to shed light on, you know, to, to be a little lighthearted that 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 was not the worst thing. But to your point, yes, um, I would say this, I would say that brands, advertisers, agencies, media outlets like the New York Interconnect, the most important thing that we brought to the table, NYI to our clients is honesty, like it's okay to be honest. We don't know. Here's the plan. Here's what we're being told from, I'm going to use sports as the example. We, we know that this is the current schedule. This is what we have to go on. This can change at any time. And in a world where there are time restraints, right? So there's a game that's supposed to air tomorrow night. We set the logs for the next day, right? So all the advertisers get locked in place to air tomorrow. The game gets canceled at three o'clock tomorrow and it's supposed to start at six o'clock. Well, there's a fundamental understanding between the agency advertisers and the media company that we need to do what's right for the client. So if that game gets postponed and moved, we make sure we move it with them. And we just be honest and open and work through it together. Because at the end of the day, you know, the majority of advertisers are looking for, and I've said it a couple of times with you, and they're looking for a brand safe environment that would allow them to reach their audience, their core audience. So there are ways to get it aside from sports, of course, um, but just being, being honest, putting all the facts out there and working together to make it as easy as possible, I think really helped us because you know, all of our, the majority of our partnerships with clients came back as sports came back and they stuck with us and they rode the ups and downs and they uh, of what happened with the NFL season when Monday night football or one of the games on Sunday got Thursday night, got postponed. It became a double header on Monday. It went from the NFL network to ESPN and we just adapt and we work together to make sure that our clients, you know, aren't get the benefit of the, those games happening. And it's, it's a collaborative effort. And, you know, I, I can't tell you there was any science to it. It was just, Stay on top of the information, make sure everyone's aware and, and, and adapt as needed. All right. So we've had a full year now, pretty much 11 months, we'll call it. Social distancing was a thing. We've seen cancellations. March Madness, we talked about. The Olympics were supposed to happen. As of right now, no one really knows what's going on with that either. What do you think, kind of in a broad perspective, the pandemic showed us about the role that sports plays in all of our lives as not only in individuals like you and I who are sports fans, but as a country who has been kind of clamoring for sports content now when we didn't have any. And at this point, it feels like we all have a different appreciation for it. And now that we have it, you know, we can't get enough of it. I think we all have an appreciation for a lot more as a father of two young children, right? As a husband, as an employee, you know, you, you, you start to appreciate the things you took for granted that you didn't really take for granted that were always there. But, you know, we went through a, a year, we're coming up on a full year of the most important thing was the health and safety of, of all of us. Right. And it, this, I always use the analogy that, you know, this pandemic, we're all in a, we're all in the same ocean. We're all on a different boat, but we're all in the same ocean kind of dealing with it together. Everyone does it a little bit differently, but we did it together. So sports, are a in the media world right now going back to New York Interconnect sports is a huge driver for advertisers it's a huge driver for brands it's where the majority of the money is is spent for networks to acquire content and it is what draws the largest eyeballs right you know the super bowl is going to get you 100 million eyeballs you know every year because it's it's appointment TV. So I think from that perspective, you know, it goes to show where the pure power of sports from an economic standpoint. I was talking about what do sports mean to the local communities? Who do they employ in each of these communicate communities from this the food from the arenas and what have you? But then on a bigger picture, and I said this back in August when I when I worked with Media Village on that article, is sports bring you hope. Sports bring you a chance to 
you know, go to that water cooler with your buddy Will and 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 text back and forth and have back and forth banter and share a moment with your dad when he might be in Florida. And you can share that moment because you're both watching the Yankees together. You know, sports gives you this wholesome feeling. For me, you know, it's I took my son to his first Yankee game in 2019. He was three at the time. We didn't make it the whole game, but I have a picture of him leaning over one of the seats with the with a with a judge shirt on and his hat. And he's staring like fascinated. And for me, it's, that's what it's all about. It's about this in everything going on, sports came back and people followed because again, it gives you a, a, a release and don't get me wrong. I, I will end by saying, I, I think sports has meant a real lot to our, to our country, our world this year. And they've taken on the burden of staying safe and playing during a pandemic and a lot of other challenges that have gone on this year. And I think, I think all of the leagues, to bring it back to one of your first questions, I think they all did it in their own way. Some, some better than others. You know, not everyone's always going to, you know, say that this person did it right or that league did it right or, or what have you. But uh, I just think that it was a, a collaborative effort. And I think that sports coming back and on the cusp of a full M MLB season and potential have fans in the stands and the New York governor just releasing that up to 10% could be in all of the arenas now for basketball and hockey. I mean, we're getting there. The light is at the end of the tunnel and that's powerful. And I'm, I'm, you know, hopefully we can stay on this course and, you know, we can have this conversation next year with a beer. Hey, I'm, I'm going to call you out on that. I'm also going to yeah. expect a uh, bracket invitation from you too, at some point, <laughs> because, it. uh, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. You know, you're, you're a big sports fan like me, and uh, that, that's what this is about. You know, what we want to get into the crooks and crannies of things. We love it. And, uh, that, you know, being able to break it down from both sides of the aisle, the business side and, and the entertainment side, you know, this has been a really good conversation. And, uh, I thank you for being the first guest on uh, View from the Grandstand. Well, hopefully, hopefully I'm not the last because, future ahead of you justin don't don't stop that passion that passion's awesome and uh, thank you for having me and uh i uh i hope i can come back on another time thank you so much absolutely thank you